agreement that has been made with the South Carolina Public Rail, the Department of Commerce, and the state over the settlement of the lawsuit that we've been engaged in uh, for several years now. Um, let me give you the format that we're going to do. Uh, Dirk Van Royalty is going to give us a presentation, and in that presentation it will tell you the basic principles and concepts behind uh, the settlement of the lawsuit. After that, I will be making some statements and comments and give Mr. King probably a chance to do the same since most of this issue is in his council district. After that, we will allow any individual that wishes to come up and ask a question uh, to come forward to the mic so that it can be recorded and we can give us your name and address and then we will answer the question. If we don't have an answer for you, we will be honest with you and tell you we don't have it and that we will try to get an answer for you. That's why we'll have your name and address so that we can do that. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll come out as informed. First, let me open it up by saying we met with the six neighborhoods uh, leadership presidents of the neighborhood councils on yesterday prior to the meeting last night. We would have loved to have been able to meet and have public hearings prior to that. The issue was we were engaged in a lawsuit. Any information that we had could have been detrimental to us until the settlement of the lawsuit if it got out to the general public. Some of those things being weaknesses that we felt we had in the lawsuit. Um, and you never let your opponents know until everything is over what those weaknesses are. And before we start, I'm going to give you those two basic changes that put us in a position that we felt that we needed to settle the lawsuit. One was when the state bought the 200 acres on the Navy base. Uh, we were put in a position where we could win the lawsuit and lose the war. Because if we won the lawsuit, the state would still own the 200 acres of land. If we uh, lost the lawsuit, the state would still own the 200 acres of land. The other issue, and probably foremost, was, as you know, we had worked with CSX to close the line down Spruill Avenue that runs through North Charleston. What we discovered uh, is that the Surface Transportation Commission, once we get to a point where CSX would give up that line, the first person in line to take that line would be Norfolk Southern Railroad. After that, the state public rail, then the city of North Charleston. So in essence, Norfolk Southern could come through the north end of the base whether we wanted them to or not. Uh, because that was an established line, even though it had not been used in a number of years, still is a rail right-of-way, and they had the right to do that. So it put us in a position some nine months ago, I guess now, nine, ten months ago, uh, that we met the first time with the mediator trying to come up with some resolve uh, to the lawsuit. And uh, over a period of nine months, we met pretty well consistently uh, until we came to a conclusion and a settlement that we believe is the best settlement that we could get on the city's half and still maintain a presence on the naval base. With that, Dirk's going to give you a, a cross view of the settlement, then I'll make a few more statements and then we will open it up to the public. Mr. Thank Mayor, you. Mr. King, Mr. Brown, uh, thank you for letting me come and give this briefing for you this evening and I'd like to tell you that as mentioned, I'm Dirk Van Royalty. I'm one of the lawyers that has worked on this for a number of years now and worked with the mayor hard in the litigation and also worked hard to try to come up with the best terms possible for the residents in North Charleston. I'd like to talk to you about the terms that are in the settlement agreement. And there are two main points and then a number of lesser points that I'll cover. The main points essentially boil down to money to the city and land of the city. Then there are some other ancillary things such as zoning, some uh, safety improvements to an S-curve and things on the base. We'll touch on those in just a second. The dollars to the city are fairly straightforward. 
the state has agreed to pay $8 million to the city of North Charleston, $2 million to come within 30 days of the settlement being issued as a court order, and then an additional $2 million each year thereafter until the full $8 million is paid. In addition, they're going to assume responsibility for approximately $6.5 million worth of debt. That's extremely important because tax increment financing bonds were issued to build the park originally. Those bonds were essentially repaid from the tax revenues for properties that were in private ownership on the base. As you can imagine, through condemnation and through the purchases that the state made on the base, we were left in a position where the bonds were outstanding and those bondholders needed to be paid, and yet the revenues that originally were there to support it had been taken away. We fought long and hard, and the state agreed to assume that debt. And so the total ends up being roughly $15 million of, of monetary compensation to the city. In addition, a substantial amount of property comes to the city. It'll be roughly 100 acres total coming our way, although we're going to trade off some back in order to avoid conflicts. And you need to understand where we're getting the land and why we're getting the land. The state originally purchased what's shown here kind of as pink and also the dark red. They purchased that outright. That was not the subject of any lawsuit. It was there. What was very concerning with the city having invested so heavily to give the citizens an opportunity to have waterfront access at the park was the fact that we were surrounded by that state land. What we tried to do as far as consolidating our ownership was to give up some of the land down in the more industrial center part of the base, which is shown as solid yellow here. Trade that to the state, approximately 50 acres. And in exchange, we pick up the parcels in this area. That allows us to replace this checkerboard approach down here where we're surrounded by the state and other industrial uses and instead come up with a cohesive, contiguous block of land that we can do something about. We also have the ability to essentially control the gateway to our park, which we thought was extremely important. Certain parcels from the city's inventory are going to go to the state, and that seemed to make sense. Uh, as I pointed to just a moment ago, that would be the solid yellow right along here. And I think that you've got to have a perspective on why that's so important. To the extent that the city has essentially little pieces of land that are pockets and surrounded by the state's holdings of the industrial property, it struck us that you were going to have continual disagreements and an opportunity to step on toes repeatedly. By giving that over to the state and then taking a solid block of land for ourselves bounded by the river, it seemed to minimize those kind of future friction. Additionally, we've given them options on properties such as the powerhouse, and the reason for that is that originally the restoration of that building, which was going to be quite expensive, was slated to serve as the gateway into the base for a private development area. To the extent that that building now would serve as the gateway into the base at the start of a rail yard, it seemed that the pun public's money could be better spent, and as a result, that is a property that we have offered to the state because it makes sense in light of their holdings for them to take it, and it makes sense for us to focus our efforts on an area where we can have some tangible results. All told, the city is receiving roughly 100 acres, and in exchange, the city is giving up about half of that, so it's a two-to-one ratio. There are certain other aspects of the uh, agreement that are also notable but of somewhat less importance. First, the city is going to support the effort once the line gets off of the base to have that go on to existing right-of-way that's already out there. And that's key because the alternative would be creating a new rail right-of-way which would require additional condemnation of additional parcels. And so we have agreed that we would support once they've left the base then using the existing corridor. Second, we talked about agreeing to some rezonings that seem to make sense in support of it. Uh, improvement to a curb that's on the base, I can show you that in another slide in just a moment, uh, that is necessary to improve some derailment issues. 
the state has agreed to cooperate with us and try to coordinate more closely with respect to job recruitment and economic development in the area. One extremely important factor here that I, I want to touch on is the surface transportation study. And that is important because not doing anything, avoiding the whole issue, trying to say that there are going to be no trains is not going to work for any of us in, in the Tri-County area. Right now, we have a port. And right now, we have ships coming in. But the ships that are on the way carry multiple times the number of containers on each ship. With the expanded capacity that's coming in there, all these boxes have to go someplace. I-26 and the local roads are already pretty much at their maximum capacity. And to try to force all of that increase onto a truck, one container to one truck, is going to result in our community being a parking lot. It's going to result in trucks trying to cut corners and come through neighborhoods, things that we thought were untenable. What we were able to work out with the state was a transportation study that the city would participate in, that the city would assist with, that would look not just at rail, but at the entire universe of problems that come with moving people and moving cargo through an area, and the entire set of impacts that the community experiences and how those can best be addressed. That's things like the best truck routes to try to keep it out of the neighborhoods, the best rail routes try to minimize inconvenience. When you have rail, the best ways to mitigate that impact, so it's quiet zones and you don't have horns blowing in the middle of the night every time they cross the roadway at five miles an hour. Things like electric switches so that they don't have to stop and walk back in order to break the train and move again. Those are the kind of things that minimize your delay at a, uh, at a rail crossing if we can get those mitigation measures put into place. The surface transportation study is designed to address that, and it should kick off very soon. I've heard as early as the beginning of the year and possible completion by the end of next year. The mayor fought hard about making sure that we have a seat at the table, and we're paying for part of the study, because I think the mayor has impressed upon all of us what he calls the golden rule in this case, which is that if you're not paying the gold, you don't get to help make the rules, and we need to have that seat at the table that touched on the truck routes and quiet zones already. But I do want to go back and specifically talk about the overpasses because in the 2002 agreement, there were three overpasses mentioned. The state was absolutely adamant that the city give up on those overpasses because they're expensive. But the mayor and council understood that they were very important to the community 10 years ago and that they're probably even more important now. And so what we said is, they're not due yet. They were never scheduled to be delivered now. They're due to be in place when the port opens. And in this agreement, we did not release the claim to those overpasses. If the surface transportation study comes up with a mitigation plan that gives a superior result to an overpass, then the mayor and the council have the ability with the community's input to pick a better course. But if they don't come up with a plan, that mitigates the impact on the community better. Then the mayor and the council have the ability to stand firm on the overpasses and insist upon them. And so that was definitely something that the state was not eager to see in this agreement, but the mayor and council were absolutely insistent upon. This is a diagram which shows what the currently proposed plan looks like from the state's perspective. And I say currently proposed because it has been somewhat of a moving target over the last uh, 24 months. And there is certainly the possibility that the surface transportation study that I just talked about may result in further refinements, may result with some improvements, we hope. But this is what's on the ground now. What you see is the yard is going to be located on the base itself, which is, as we all know, an area that for the better part of 100 years has been industrial. The first iteration of this plan that the state approached the city with years ago saw the, the yard here and then bringing it all the way down the entire length of the base right over the park to come out. What we've worked around to is that they would cut that length on the base about in half 
by coming out in the vicinity of, of McMillan. They would then get on, ideally, what they're planning for is to get on an existing rail right of way here until they eventually work their way back along to Virginia Avenue. There are several realities that I think everybody needs to understand when you look at the option of continuing to litigate or settling as, as we've done in this instance, because I think they put the settlement in a, in a much different light than one that you can understand. First of all, I touched on it a minute ago, doing nothing is not an option. I mean, Charleston has been a seaport since its creation and North Charleston is the hub of transportation and commerce in this area and has been for years, none of that's going to change. The new ships are coming with the Panama Canal enlarging and you're going to have more containers. And whether we fight or don't fight, that fact isn't going to change. And so what you're faced with is a flood of containers and the question becomes, what are you going to do with them? And that flood of containers is really independent even of having a base here. If they come into Wando Welch, they come over 526 and they enter North Charleston. If they went down to the uh, to the city of Charleston, they end up going out through the city of North Charleston. If they go to the North Charleston terminal, they come out through us. And so this fight aside, the mayor and council, I think, wisely recognized we got to deal with the problem because the no, the no action option doesn't work. By allowing the base to remain industrial in this area, what we've done is essentially kept the yard on that property behind what traditionally has been a fence. And while we have talked about trying to get them into some other more desirable locations, the fact is, if they didn't build it there and they chose another area, they could go in and condemn there and there would not be an ability for the city to stop it. In this instance, we had a fight because some of our property, a small fraction was actually involved. But if they had pushed out into other areas of the community, there would have been much, much less that the city could do to stop it or to leverage that into a settlement. The route that we were eventually able to fight for, this is the second point to consider, has preserved about half of the northern end of the base and frankly the most historic area. Originally the line was slated to come through here, which is the old historic Navy Hospital area. It was going to come right by your housing area, your park as it looped back around and in. And the settlement allowed us to have some influence over that routing and to keep it more to the south than it would otherwise have been. The next factor, and I think this is not understood as, as often as it might be, is that the city's ability to fight the northern access was most direct on this actual base property. Once the rail forces its way off of the base property, whether it comes down here from the south, whether it comes from anywhere else, once it gets to the existing rail corridors, the Surface Transportation Board, which is a federal agency, is the predominant regulating agency that has control over that. It determines when rails, when rail carriers have to share lines. It determines what routes they get to use. And the city, as powerful as it might be in some circumstances, is not a player at the Surface Transportation Board. And so the mayor and council recognized that while we could have some influence in some areas, that once it got to the existing rail corridor, one of the better options we had was to keep it on an existing corridor rather than having new lines created possibly in other areas. The mayor touched on this a moment ago, and I want to go back to it, and that is the impact of South Carolina's purchase of over 200 acres of property here in this area and uh, some parcels up there. A complete victory in a lawsuit against the state of South Carolina would not have erased the state's holding. A complete victory for us would not have erased the fact that the public's park in this area would be completely at the mercy of the Department of Commerce. By reaching a settlement and gaining control of a contiguous parcel in here, we're able to make sure that the gateway, the entryway to that park is preserved and we've got the ability to, to keep it up. Finally, and my PowerPoint mentions bonds, but 
I want to talk to you about stability because it gave stability by having a known outcome. It gives stability with respect to our bonds. It allows us to know how those are going to be covered and repaid. But it gives stability to the people in the community, to homeowners, to residents, to people looking to invest because when you know what the outcome is, you can make plans accordingly. But I think one of the, the most debilitating factors in terms of seeing progress is when people don't know because they don't know if they can move in, they don't know if they should sell and move out. They don't know anything. They don't want to invest. They don't want to put down roots when they don't know what's going to happen. And so litigation, had it gone on for another two or three or five years, would have left us with a considerable period of instability, of uncertainty, and we didn't at the point think that that was beneficial to the community. Mayor, Mr. King, Mr. Brown. Let me uh, add a few things to it. We've invested three quarters of a million dollars in fighting this lawsuit and legal fees to date. Uh, and we were getting to the point that uh, we were getting ready for court. Uh, and that's when the ex real expense comes, when you start getting ready to get your testimonies ready and, and move forward. We've been through depositions. And we still feel like that we were right. But sometimes being right doesn't always make you a winner. We had to take the circumstances that we've got. When the state came in and paid, and if you'll remember, they paid $24 million for 200 acres of land on the Navy base. We're getting half of that land back. So not only are we getting the money that we're getting, uh, the basically $15 million, we're getting $12 million of property uh, as well. Uh, so a park on the Navy base is one thing. A park with no control of the property around it is a whole different ballgame. If we want to enhance the park for the future, we needed to be able to control the waterfront on the rest of the property from the shipyard all the way to Virginia Avenue, and this allows us to do that. There's roughly 22 acres left in between the two parcels that we will get uh, that are south, uh, north of uh, Noisette Creek. That is currently used by Spaywalk. Uh, it's federally being used by federal occupation. We have the right to that property if they go away. So that gives us the additional 22 acres, so it would give us roughly 124 acres on the waterfront uh, still left that the North Charleston would control and have control over for the future. And we thought that that was extremely important. The other thing in them paying off the 6.5 million in bonded indebtedness that we have out there, it gives us the ability to use that 6.5 million not to pay off the park but to enhance future activity for that area and for the park. Uh, we have the TIF dollars already coming in. You gotta remember these were bonds that were not floated and paid for out of the general revenue. It was bonds being paid for by the growth on the shipyard. A tax increment financing district was created by the state. It's a 30 year tax increment financing district. Every penny of tax that's collected out there goes to uh, the city to float bonds to do infrastructure needs out there. Uh, the school district gets none, the county gets none, the city gets none. It all goes to infrastructure for improvements to that property. And that was established by the state. It was an unusual bond because the first 15 years, you could float a 30-year bond. So you actually ended up the first year with a 45-year capability. We, um, the other thing I, I think that you need to understand a little more in detail as well, the reason we want to keep the one building to 2017 that's located is um, it's located directly across from Building 7. You know where the, if you go into the base, you know where the parking lot is across from Building 7. That parking lot actually belongs to the state. But there's a building in the middle of it uh, that we own. Now the state, the federal government has a 99-year lease on it for a dollar a year. So it's not any money to us, except that the state created an area on the base 
that any federal employee that works out there, that the state tax that they pay goes back to the entity in which owns the property that they're on. The RDA gets the bulk of the money. But from that one building, the city gets about a half a million dollars a year in revenue. That is in place until 2017. So in the next five years, that would be two and a half million dollars of revenue coming to us, and we didn't want to give it up. Uh, so we're holding that building to 2017, and then we will transfer it to the state. It is surrounded by state-occupied land, so it will have no value to us other than the income that's coming in over the next five years. So we wanted to make sure that we held on to that income that's coming in uh, to us as a city for operation of services out there. Uh, the park, we, uh, the RDA has been working with us, and one of the things that they have talked about doing is giving us a million dollars toward the stabilization, the redevelopment authority on the base of the Admiral's House. That is key uh, to us because that building has needed some stabilization for a long time. We anticipate to redo that building is going to run somewhere around three to three and a half million dollars to bring it where it needs to be. But it is an historic building in the city of North Charleston and we need to preserve it. One of the other things that they've talked about doing is replicating the chapel on that property. The chapel currently is located adjacent uh, on property that we had given to Clemson that was going to be now taken by the state and it is deteriorated to the point it cannot be relocated. So as you come into the base, into the park area, we're looking at rebuilding that chapel, a replica of that chapel on the hill that's up there. And what a great location then we've got to offer weddings and, and bridal uh, receptions and things of that nature with the Admiral's House, with H&I. And then quite honestly, the city plans to, to see new housing built in there. Uh, we think it's a gorgeous area that will give an opportunity for people to come buy lots and build houses in there that match the integrity of the housing that is currently there. The rest of the money we're going to invest in North Charleston in that area. And that money will go to replace some of the things that we're losing, uh, such as things that we currently have going on in the property that Clemson was getting anyway, and to make use of some properties we can do to replace what's going on we would have but done in the, uh, in the uh, electric house there, that, that big building that we knew that we were going to have to put millions of dollars in to get use out of what we wanted, but it was going to be the focal point of the entry to the naval base. Well, it's no longer going to be the focal point. Focal point coming that way would be a rail line going out. Now, to explain to you where the rail will be going under the current plan, the rail leaving the Navy base would come out to Spruill Avenue and follow the train line that is currently there. If they can work out an arrangement between Norfolk Southern and CSX, there will only be one line going out, and that will be a shared line controlled by state rail. Once it crosses Noisette Creek, it will turn to the right. If you know where our current public works facility is, we're in the process of building a new public works facility. And so we're not going to need that land where the public works facility is anymore. We still want to maintain the front on the creek as part of the pres preserved properties that we want all the way in the length of the creek. It will turn and then take a path that goes over O'Hare Avenue, turns back and ties in to um, Virginia Avenue and bypass the, the neighborhoods and the old village shopping area. We also have worked with CSX that they will come down the Bexley Street line and then turn and join into that line <coughs> and do away with the rail between Break, um, Bexley Street down through Montague Avenue in the Old Village. So that line will go away and the route will go around uh, to Virginia Avenue. Now the purpose of the surface transportation study is to find the best ways to move that, that rail traffic. 
Does North and Southern need to go one direction and CSX need to go the other so you split the amount of trains going out? Working with South Carolina Public Rails, we also will be working on the timing of when those trains come in and out. Uh, as you well know, it's not uncommon on North Red to have that road blocked at 7.30 in the morning when we've got peak traffic, 12 o'clock in the afternoon when we've got peak traffic, and 5.30 in the afternoon when we've got peak traffic. The purpose of designing the rail where you don't have to stop to build trains is important because if you have to stop, you go across the road, you stop. You have to let the pressure on the plane, on the train wear down. Somebody has to run to the back, change the switch manually, and then they back up. When they hook up again, they come back again. We want to stop all that from happening. The other thing that we're going to be looking for is quiet zones, and the quiet zones means that when they cross somewhere, they don't have to blow the horn. Uh, we've done that at Montague, and we've done it on South Red. It makes the drop arms come down, but then you have to build a cement in the area where vehicles can't go around and go through for safety reasons. And we're going to be working with the state to accomplish that in all of those areas that these train routes go through. Um, are we where we wanted to be? We honestly think we shouldn't be have had to get into this situation. But it's almost like fighting your parents. You know, you sue your parents and they've got a little more control than you do. And the state has a little more control than we do. And, and we're realists. At the end of the day, the difference in a dreamer and someone who has to come to realization with facts is that you have to make determination what's in the best interest at the end of the day of your community. And that's where we had to come. The bottom line, we're in this battle whether we wanted to be in the battle or not. We could win the battle and still lose the war. We wouldn't have any control over anything else that goes on on the naval base because the properties that the state bought, you got to remember there's about another 80, 90 acres that Noisette still owns. All of it's up for sale. But we have to look at what we can do to preserve the waterfront areas for the city of North Charleston. How do we get the trains out the best way we can? North Charleston's not unaccustomed to trains. But what has happened over the years, there's been more trains. And there's never been proper planning on how to move those trains through the community. We've got to work on that. But the surface transportation study goes far deeper than the trains, and that's something that's really been an issue with us, is truck traffic. Uh, we need the state to help us to identify truck routes and then help us enforce those truck routes. If not, we're going to have trucks coming through our neighborhoods, folks. It's going to happen. And none of the things that have happened to date have addressed that. This surface transportation study will look at the needs for the next 25 years. We do not have a plan in hand today to expand the width of I-26 from 526 to the Port Connection Road. Now there's going to be a lot more trucks moving out and coming in based upon these post panamatic ships coming in. And we've widened I-26 to that point, but we've got to widen it even further. And we're going to, the state's going to have to come up with funding over those years to do that. And it's not going to be inexpensive. But if we don't have a plan, it won't get done. This actually will help us develop that plan, but more than anything for us, it will limit roads that trucks can travel on through communities. Now, we can do it if we buy all the roads from the state and take them over, then we have complete jurisdiction. That's what we did on Montague Avenue. If you notice, trucks, except for deliveries, can't cross the railroad track going through the old village, and that's because we took that road over for maintenance. We did the same thing on Duran Avenue from Rivers Avenue to the Circle, so the trucks would have to turn and go up Rivers Avenue to get to 526 to get to 26. Uh, but this will give us a complete study of that entire area, not just the three overpasses 
that we're looking for, but every location where there's an overpass, we will come up with a study that really helps us and the state to understand what we need to do to move vehicular traffic and rail traffic. Somebody said, um, I almost feel like this has been a, a wedding for me. You know, when you get married, you find out you don't always get your way. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you have to come to compromises that make the marriage work. And that's what we've had to, to do with this. Um, this has not been an easy point. We've been meeting in these meetings for nine, ten months, trying to come to a resolution. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, we didn't get everything we wanted, and I can assure you they didn't get everything they wanted. At the end of the day, they have understood that they just couldn't come in and take anything and do what they wanted without dealing with us as a community. And that was very important. I think it's not only important for us, it's important for every community in the state of South Carolina to realize that sometimes you just have to stand up and fight for those things that you feel are right. And uh, I want to personally thank Dirk uh, he's been a stalwart in helping us with all this stuff and has put a lot of man hours uh, in helping us keep up with the legal side of it. He has been outstanding. Ray Anderson in my office has worked diligently with us as well to try to, to keep us focused because sometimes we'd leave the meeting and I'd be so unfocused because I was really just wanting to slap somebody. But, you know, you, you have to stay focused and get beyond those personal feelings so that we can make decisions that's in the best interest of the city. And our council has been very supportive in everything that uh, we've done trying to work this out. I can't say enough about Bob King and how hard he has worked, because uh, most of this is in his district, uh, working with us because he loves that area. Now, some of the, you may ask us a timeline. Well, you know, the port was originally going to open in 2016, then it went 2017, then 2018, now it's 2019. And it may extend in beyond that. Somebody's asked us when the rail line's going to go away through the old village. Well, it's going to go away when the other rail line is built. But that rail line is not needed until the port is completed. So we're probably talking seven years or less or more. We're not positive but it's something that we're going to be working on. Uh, the study, we believe, will be completed by the end of next year. And so then we've got some guidelines in which to go by. When the study is being made, we will have public hearings to review these with the neighborhoods so that you can see what the plans are showing. And I can assure you that this body will not stand by and accept the study. That's why we wanted to participate in the payment of the study so we can help choose who does the study and then we have input in that study and then we've got part of the decision making process of what we accept in that study and they're going to have to show us that we don't need overpasses in order for us to give up on the three overpasses that we were guaranteed. To clarify that a little bit, that's our argument has been with the state that the state is the state is the state. In other words, if one entity of the state of South Carolina makes a commitment, then all other entities of the state of South Carolina have to honor that. The state has said that's not true, that uh, the state ports authority can't bind other departments of state government. So the one thing that the state port authority that is in concrete in the MOU that we have with them is that we will have three crossings, overpasses built prior to the port opening. And if they don't come up with a better way, we will hold them to that. We will not allow the port to open until those overpasses are constructed. The other thing that you need to understand, we had an MOU. It's called a Memorandum of Understanding. I had faith in it. <laughs> I don't have faith in MOUs anymore. Okay, because we, we've been through all this. The settlement that we have done that was voted on last night by council and voted on this morning by the state budget and control board will come in the form of a court 
order based upon the settlement of the lawsuit. So the things that have been agreed upon now are court ordered that they be carried forward. MOU doesn't mean anything toward that. The only thing we're basically latching on to the MOU is the right to get those overpasses if we truly see that we need them uh, at the end of the day. Bob? Thank you, Mary. You pretty well covered a lot of the stuff. Let me say that I have not been a happy camper during this negotiation, and uh, but I know the mayor has, has worked very hard at that, and uh, also uh, one of our councilmen, Ron Princeton, uh, helped him with that, who was familiar with port activities. And uh, But uh, the important thing is that the mayor has made an effort to uh, contact the community. We met with the uh, Civic Club presidents. I insist that we do that. Uh, he did that. We did that yesterday. Uh, we wanted to have input from them as to what was uh, transpiring and what was going on as we were getting the information down from that. I think the important thing that the mayor has said here tonight about the surface transportation, that's so important, and the overhead over uh, passes. And the, uh, the surface transportation study is so important to us because that's a federal agency, as he mentioned, and we, they can change those routes. It doesn't necessarily go that route that goes up by Virginia Avenue doesn't necessarily have to happen if they determine that there's a better route. And I got a couple of suggestions for them when we have that meeting for some other routes that they might go. Whether they will do that or not, but it does give us input in that. And I think that's so important that we have that in there and have our feedback because we are supporting that study also. And that, that's, uh, that has been is very important to us for that input that we'll have on that. And that's, uh, like I said, uh, agency, they don't have to go by the, that route that they have designed for us. Uh, it can go other places, and we hope that that will happen with public input from people like yourselves. Uh, we'll certainly have input on that also at that particular time. And the other thing is we, we had the overpasses, those things that we've been concerned about, the North Red Avenue overpass, uh, getting that in before that uh, takes place. Uh, we've indicated that. We didn't uh, do away with those overpass uh, restrictions, and we stay, they're still in, as the mayor indicated to you, and they're still in. We're going to enforce those things. We don't, uh, we're not going to, and this is the on, ongoing thing. It's going to be for a while. We get, if we get that transportation study started now, early next year, we'll be able to have input, start having input from the public, even for a long period of time there. So, so I think that's important. So. So we uh, move forward. I do uh, thank the administration for their, certainly for their efforts and for uh, trying to include us and doing the best we possibly could do it. Like the mayor said, we did get get everything we wanted, but we got did the best we possibly could do, and uh, I think that uh, we we can have to live with it uh, and go from there. And uh, of course, Councilman Brown here is is the another area that's affected down south, uh, where the terminal's going to be, and he's probably going to have a couple of comments. But uh, he's affected by this thing also, and so we're, we're the two that, that has to uh, make this thing work, and we're going to continue with that pressure from time to time on getting things done in our, in our area. So I appreciate all your help and your, your assistance, and I appreciate you coming out here tonight. Mr. Graham. First, I want to say thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Dirk. As, I, as Mr. King said, uh, as I look through the audience, most is, is his constituents, but an entire base from the most southern end up to Noise at Creed is my district, uh, District 10. I know there's a lot of changes that has made. We spoke on the memorandum of 2002 made in State Port Authority. It's 10 years ago. A lot that we want to hold to those memorandum, but as time change, I guess we have to change this, make changes that would best benefit the community. Looking at what took place, it was not only the community, the city of North Charleston, the state, the business sector. In that whole 10-year span, we've got Boeing, we've got the Research Center. We've got a lot of other things that has impacted the city and outcomes, saying where are we going to go for the next 20, 25 years? I think this is a move that had to be made, one that would benefit us, but one also had to look at the interests of the folks that live in the area. I think there's more work needs to be done. I think there's a lot that's going to be done. The transportation study is going to be able to help it. But I think there's other things that we need to look at also, and I think we will be able to do that as council. But I'd like to say thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Administration. Thank you for the turn. Even though it was a lot of money spent, we said, 
but as we move forward, I think we'll probably get reimbursed some of that back. So I know there's a lot of things we're going to have to do, and it wouldn't be more important to ask for a community input when those changes are made. Thank you. Okay, with that, we're going to open it up for any questions you have. If you just please come forward to this mic, state your name and address, and give us your question. Anybody that wants to come forward, just come on forward and line up. Yes, sir. Uh, when you were describing the uh, rail route redesignation or whatever a while ago, I missed some of the landmarks. The current rail route uh, that goes from the trestle toward 526. Um, that will go away. That's going to go away? Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it may be seven years, but it's going away. Hopefully, I'll be alive to see it. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mayor and City Council persons. Good evening. Mayor, I'm here tonight because I wanted to be here when you took down the flag that says do not shred. And then I'm here on behalf of the concerned citizens of North Charleston and Northwood Estates to ask you please to approve a $40,000 amount from all its TIF money to $14 million to do a noise study that that surface study will help out if we got the noise study and the surface study, we would know then that Northwood Estates is negatively impacted by the same noise that we were fighting to downplay in that area of North Charleston. So I am asking you publicly, going on the record, Mayor, and I'll, I will do it again on next Thursday, to please delegate, set aside $40,000 for a noise study so we can fight the state on the Part B money that they seem not to have to give the quality of life that the citizens of Northwood Estates deserve. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll be standing outside to see that Do Not Tread sign come down. It's down, darling. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. We took it down today. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Anthony Gentilly. I live at 4106 O'Hare Avenue. And I think I pretty well understand the new rail system and, and what your pro, uh, what's being proposed. One thing I th think, and it hasn't been mentioned, it's going to be really impacted. You're going to have trains coming up parallel to uh, McMillan, where Noisette was ripping out the tracks, and then turning across St. John's <clears throat> and going back to Spruill. Equally, you're going to have trains coming on the old Bexley track coming across where potentially it'll it, and it'll cross O'Hare. Potentially you could have a train block in St. John's, you could have a train block in O'Hare. That means our neighborhood is totally locked in. We have no way to get emergency vehicles in there because those are our only two ways in and out of that property. So I believe in this study you need to come up with some other ways, potentially opening the old gate there or something where we're able to exit out of there, you know what I mean? Because you've got a CSX train, but maybe it's coming the old Bexley, you've got a Norfolk Southern coming this way, and they're not gonna necessarily co coordinate with each other, so. And one of the things <coughs> that, that I think people need to remember, these rails are going to be controlled by the, the South Carolina public rail system. And so they will determine when the trains cross. And so, be honest with you, it's a lot easier for me to talk to Jeff McWhorter with South Carolina Public Rails, right. who lives in Somerville, than it is to talk to head of Norfolk Southern and CSX, because uh, I can't get to them. Yeah. And so one of the things that we've talked about is the timing of trains when they're moving uh, and better coordination of those schedules when they're moving. Uh, and one of the things that w the port's going to have to to work with to help us with the truck transportation and I think this study will show that. You, the port closes basically at dark. Now, there's no reason that those things can't be transported from 11 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning when we don't have traffic on 526 and 26 And so I think this is the importance of that study. We've said it, nobody's listened to us. But if the, transport, the Federal Transportation Board uh, comes up and says it, I think we can get a little more uh, understanding. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. 
Yes, sir. First, I'd like to say we appreciate your efforts. Uh, I'm glad to see this being resolved. Um, my name is George Hogaboom, and I live at 2545 Hobson. So I'm in the Senior Officer's Historic District. And my question pertains to the Historic District. I was curious, uh, I was happy to see, or happy to hear that you were going to focus on the Admiral's House because it's in need of immediate Drastic care. Uh, there's also some other uh, very historic buildings in the district and I was wondering what your uh, intent was with those uh, are you planning to stabilize and rehab them or sell them or? everyone that is, is in on the historic list will either be redone by the city or sold to someone with an understanding they've got a timeline to redo them great uh, and then we would like to come in with some infill housing the brick housing can come down Right. So we've got an opportunity to do some infill housing that uh, would resemble and look like uh, the era that these buildings were built in. As you know, the one across from H&I is getting to the point it needs drastic. Yes. The little house across the street most people don't realize was the schoolhouse. And so we're going to definitely restore that and make something out of it that's a, a memory of that, that schoolhouse that was located there. Uh, and then, uh, but it, we want to create an, an area that's inviting to people, uh, but also is a, a neighborhood. Uh, well, this just well. seems in keeping with Noisette's plans, uh, right. the way you described it. And I, then H&I, and I, uh, we approved, even during the litigation, the state came to us knowing that uh, in the settlement we may get that property and asked would we agree to a, a lease of seven years to the redevelopment authority on H&I. We did that because they have put over a million dollars of improvements to that building. Mm -hmm. uh, they are a year into that lease and in six years that building reverts back to the owner which now uh, in 30 days will be the city of North Charleston. So it was an opportunity to get some money put in to fix the building sure. uh, without it having to come out of the, the coffers of the city. I have just one follow-up. Uh, as it pertains to uh, the covenants and restrictions that are currently in place, is it your intent to continue that? I know there's a lawsuit pending on The it. covenants and restrictions will definitely, if not those exact, we will create covenants and restrictions for the areas that we control. Uh, the covenants and restrictions for the rest of it uh, <coughs> probably will change. If you remember, that was a planned development district anyway, and so some of that zoning will change. But we believe everything can mix together as long as we have mutual respect for each other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Paul Wilzinski, 5278 East Dolphin. I was wondering if you could clarify something for me that I've, that I've never quite understood that has to do with the Clemson land. You, uh, the, the the city had given Clemson quite a bit of acreage, it's my understanding, in the beginning. About 72 acres. acres. Okay, and now some of the Clemson land is being foreclosed on by, or condemned, condemned by the state by the of South state. Carolina. Okay, is that, going to, uh, is that going to impact what Clemson was able to do, is, is able to do? Uh, they're still going still across the street from that they're doing the wind turbine facility now they've actually got a new building going up behind it and then on the waterfront they're actually going to create a new school uh, that I think the Zucker family donated five million dollars toward that school and it's going to be built so they've got land on the other side and what the state has told us Senator Leatherman told me directly that the state is going to make Clemson whole on that property and so I don't know if it would be sections of the outer parking lot or some of the properties across the street uh, from Hobson as it goes out. But they're going to make them whole so that we can do the, the uh, technology studies that we wish to see happening that will draw new interest to the, the low country occurring out there. So the rail uh, 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 situation isn't, isn't going to be really impacting them? No, it, other than relocating where that concept is where they would be building the innovative centers where they're working with industry to create labs and research uh, locations not 
unsimilar to what's going on in the upper part of the state with ICAR. Okay. But this would be more in, in technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Mayor. Uh, my name is Daniel Nato. I live at 5356 Hartford Circle. And I'm also the president of the North Charleston Artists Guild here in the city. Uh, we work real closely with the Cultural Arts Department, and it's my understanding that three venues that have been the Cultural Arts Department um, that are on this, that will be uh, that are on land that will now be the states. Those include Sterrett Hall, a 900-seat auditorium and rehearsal space, the Production Hall, which is rehearsal, classroom, and meeting spaces, and the Rhodes Art Center, where we currently have artist studios. Uh, is that correct? Yes, and those already belong to Clemson University and then the state condemned them to take them. But we no longer own those properties. Is there, are there the plans? The only property that we own was the um, power plant uh, and that was going to be converted into a lot of uses for art programs knowing that we were having to give up the others. We're now faced with the dilemma that if we're not going to use it, we're probably going to be better off building a new facility somewhere in that area. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to inquire on that to see if, if there are plans, because, um, you know, providing as an artist in the community, my wife is an artist, we want a business based around the arts, um, to make sure that that's not forgotten, because that's incredibly important. Our vision important. for the arts is still intact. Uh, it's just that now we probably will end up building something new um, that will not take redesigning of a, a facility such as the powerhouse uh, and what we've got to decide is where that's going to be. Uh, is it going to be on properties that we are inheriting um, on uh, the waterfront or is it going to be properties uh, that we use somewhere in the old village that we go to Garco to or something like that to buy a piece of property to do what we need to do. But our commitment to the art community is as strong as it's ever been. Uh, it's just that in this case, I don't see us investing $10 million into a powerhouse that's going to have a rail yard running, a rail line running in front of it. Are there any particular funds that are set aside right now to offset what's going to be lost by taking out these that three venues? That would be a designation of council. But what you've got to remember, we're sitting now with $6.5 million from the bonding capacity and we'll have eight million over a four-year period of time. So we're roughly sitting at uh, 14, 15 million dollars of capability. Uh, but if it's off the base, we can also use regular bond uh, revenues as well. Uh, what we've got to come up, and we'll be getting with Marty Besanson about it. What do we need to do? And the first phase would be to come in with someone that can help us design what we need to do that handles the needs for programming uh, as well as classrooms and as well as uh, places for artists to have uh, their shops in. Great. Thank you. I appreciate your time. I haven't put aside the fact that, that may be another old building. It's a very large brick building with large windows in it back at the Garco plant right. that we may show some interest in. All right. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, good evening, gentlemen. I'm Alan McDowell from Goose Creek. Yes, and not being a resident of North Charleston, I haven't been following this thing that closely. But listening to your presentation tonight, uh, everything that you've mentioned has been in the city's uh, best interest. Could you say anything other than settling the lawsuit where the state has come out ahead? Well, the state as a whole is coming out ahead because it, it, we understand industry and both class one rails do need access to the port and we understand that. In fact, when we were in the negotiations with the Port Authority, we were the ones who said you got to have rail uh, because it's in our advantage and I think Dirk mentioned this, for every double stack container that goes out by rail, that's two less trucks that's driving through our community. And we understand that. And, uh, and we think that's important. Um, but we did, the basic thing that we were trying to do is say, listen, we know it's the state public, public rail. 
We know it's the state port authority. But you're dealing with one individual community. And we've always done our part for the economic development of the low country in the state of South Carolina. But don't come in here and, as the flag said, tread on me to do it. Come in and work with me to do it in a way that our community can live with that's going to not damage our community, but what ways can we find to make it enhance the community? Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor, everyone. My name is Helen Wiley, and I represent Green Grove Community, which is the South End. And my concern is when, uh, when you go into these studies that Green Grove will be incorporated because we do have a large impact with the report going to be expanding. Um, we have been fighting and trying to get like a wall barrier, um, eliminating the entrance to our community. As you stated, you didn't want any trucks coming in and out of residential areas. And we have this going on every single day because our community is the entrance for CSX Railway where they are um, coupling the trains. And we just would like to be heard and we would like to have, you know, be able to be in the studies so we won't be eliminated as a resident of the um, city of North Charleston. And our community has been established since pretty much 1946. And when the studies come, we just ask that you can continue Absolutely. to keep Green Grove in the plans. One of the things we hope the study will help us indicate is some of the activity from uh, the yard over there going to shift to the naval base. Okay. Um, because your problems is you're in a yard where they're making up trains. Mm -hmm. I've, I've visited over there and heard those mm -hmm. things banging together, uh, making up. and very intrusive on your quality of life and we mm -hmm. completely understand that and we will make sure that that's a part of what Thank we're you. looking at. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Mayor, members of council, first uh, let me thank you for all the hard work that you put into these negotiations. I know that uh, this was not easy for y'all. Um, also realize that the commerce implications here are, are, are greater than, than just the Park Circle area and so we understand all of all of those um, all of those issues. Uh, I live at 4456 uh, Hope Circle which is part of the Hope's Point development at the south end of uh, Old North Charleston um, in one of the neighborhoods that's perhaps most uh, impacted by the, the new expansion of rail and I know a lot of the my neighbors are here tonight as well because we are just deeply concerned about the level of impact that will that will happen on on our community. Um, you know, we invested in in our homes uh, in that neighborhood because of our perception of really high quality of life. Um, we have you know very well built homes, safe streets, uh, beautiful marsh views. We absolutely treasure the marsh that's around our houses and. Uh, it's part of what you know drove us to, to live in this part of Park Circle, and so um, you know we appreciate the fact that that you fought hard for this surface transportation study, and uh, really want to see that happen. Uh, I guess my question to you is: Are there other opportunities outside of that uh, for residents that are most direct directly impacted by this uh, to offer feedback uh, and to be at the table? Um, while some of these decisions are being made. Uh, I'm just curious if there has been any consideration of a Citizens Advisory Committee or we anything else. We will definitely else. keep the community informed Absolutely. and have open meetings. Now, you're located off of Fust. Right. Correct. The actuality of the new line will actually shift it further away from your property. Right. Uh, there was an existing line that Norfolk Southern uh, CSX was looking at reopening, actually came um, across the marsh from y'all, uh, there was another street, and then beyond that was an old trailer park. Right. And there was a line that came down the side of that trailer park. This is actually shifted down beyond that, uh, closer to the Noisette Creek. Right. Um, because today's trains can't make the turns that they did on the shorter rails and so it would need to have a, a smoother transition of glide back to um, 
Virginia Avenue. Right, we appreciate that, and we were uh, very happy to see that this morning that that line had been pushed back. The reality of the situation is, you know, we can stand in the middle of our street right now and see the container ships go down the Cooper River. Um, it's just great views of the marsh and just treasure the, the whole watershed, the whole environmental system there. We so part of our concern is that, you know, the impact we'll definitely of definitely engage. Uh, we've got your neighborhood, we've got yeah. that uh, end of old North Charleston, but then we've also got the other new neighborhood. And I actually, because he was going back to England and couldn't release anything to the media, uh, I actually had conversation with him when he was here the last time about the rerouting of the rail through there, and he felt comfortable with it, uh, a lot more comfortable than the route they had where it was coming through the old historic district of the Navy. But we. Ryan, let me say to you that uh, we're going to have input from that neighborhood as long as I'm around, that those neighborhoods will have input. And uh, we, we made a special effort to uh, contact them. And when we had the briefing with the uh, Civic Club presidents, uh, that's what it was all about, to try to get it rolling. And we're going to continue it from the citizens over there. We'll have, continue to have that uh, input. Because when we do this study, Every day, we want to have some kind of input to it. Right. Well, we, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to provide input, and I think yeah. what we're looking for is some Let me type of formalized too about the, uh, mechanism. The, the uh, quiet zones and the, uh, the buffer zones, uh, we're going to insist on those. Right. No question about it. We you will. Know, as much as we can, possibly can. To your answer, Ryan, we will consider those, um, and, and we'll get with the administration and council to, to look at what format we also will get with the state uh, because they will need to be informed and part of that engagement of the format as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Kate Besta, um, 4723 Coley Morris Lane. Um, kind of along the lines of what he was just speaking about, when the train makes the turn past Noise at Creek, where the um, current facility for um, the public works is is it going to be is it going to take any residents out i mean or is it going to so so it's going to go through land over to virginia that's not going to affect any residents to, um, it will follow if there's any house that would have to be moved if there's there's one house that's built back up in there uh, sort of in the wood oh area, yeah i think that I know may be affected up. we're not sure yet okay. one of the things we were trying to do is preserve seeing heating uh, mm -hmm. Since we're giving up our property where the uh, current public works facility is, by turning there, seeing heating and how good, mm -hmm. what is that commercial? Okay, anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> odd, odd yeah. distributor. And right. And um, we don't want to affect any more businesses or property owners or homeowners especially than, than we have to. Okay. Uh, and, and what you've got to remember, this study is, is going to take a while and the permitting process is going to take a while mm -hmm. because you've got wetlands and waterways that are going to have to be crossed that permitting is going to have to take place. Uh, you've got the current rail line there but you're going to have to come in. Uh, the trains today are a lot heavier than the trains of the past and all that's going to have to be new construction of support uh, mechanisms to hold the rail as it goes across that marsh to line itself mm -hmm. back up with um, Virginia Avenue. So it's going to be a, a long process. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for input, you know, for input. Um, also, when, since you were at one point hoping the powerhouse would be that kind of main attraction when you came in, since that's not going to be, um, that really is the main entrance into the Navy base that people travel to go to the, the waterfront park. Is that, is that still going to be? It still will be there. Uh, in fact, uh, they're looking at doing an overpass over the rail coming into Cosgrove. Okay. Also, the, the state has already appropriated the funding to replace the rail overpass on Cosgrove that currently exists between Rivers and Azalea. Mm -hmm. uh, while they're doing that, uh, since we're looking at redevelopment of the Ship Watch and Naval Hospital area, we're wanting to create a better looking corridor coming into North Charleston. Right by going back to I-26, coming in with new design street lighting, uh, landscaping, 
those type of things on Cosgrove because that is a focal entry to the city of North Charleston right. and take that all the way to Spruill Avenue um, and then try to intertwine it into the surrounding communities with the redevelopment that's going to be occurring in there as well. Okay. One of the reasons that we were interested in the Naval Hospital is we realized that the possibility we were going to lose that entryway. Right. And so that's 22 point something acres that every day I got a phone call from Mr. King saying we need to buy that Naval Hospital, <laughs> we need to buy that Naval Hospital. Uh, and, and we did. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're wanting to make that focal point better and then we still will be working looking at parking, especially on the 4th of July and major events right. like that. Right. One of the keys to us getting some of the property across the creek is that we can now go ahead and create, addition, create additional parking for smaller events and venues that go on out at the park and we're going to build a walkover across Noisette Creek uh, for parking to for people to enter into the park. Are they going to keep the powerhouse? Is they they don't they can't tear it down. Okay, because it's just uh, a yeah, building. It's, it's an historic house. building, right. and they haven't decided to take it yet. We've offered oh, it to them. I see. Uh -huh. But if if they don't take it, then we'll find Please. something to do with right. it. But it can't be the central focal point right. anymore of our entry because that's no longer uh, the design of the water out front and and all that. Mm -hmm. Uh, is going away. Right. Thank you. Um, Mayor and uh, Councilman King and gentlemen, I want to thank you for your hard work that you've put in and the mediation process is not always easy. Um, my fear, I appreciate the road study that is being done and it will be thorough and last a year. However, my concern is once bit, twice shy as far as the state goes. We all had a lot of faith in the MOU. And I'm wondering once the study is done and once recommendations are made, federal, state, local, how much leverage does the city of North Charleston have in what happens? Well, once the study's done on the implementation, we don't have a lot of leverage. But since it's a federal, it's a study that will be approved by a federal agency, it gives us a lot more uh, leverage because it is a plan that was designed by the Federal Transportation, Surface Transportation, and approved by their board. Uh, and then the state has is, is got to make commitments. The only thing that we feel very solid on that we've got a commitment is the overpasses because that MOU did not engage any other state agency on that issue that was guaranteed to us by the Port Authority and let's just face the facts of life if the Port Authority doesn't open they don't need the rail yard and so I think good business sense and, and the state has given us every indication they want to move forward in a progressive manner to make this work. And, you know, I'm going to say something that's a, a little scary and most political people wouldn't like to say. We're going to have to increase the gas tax in the state of South Carolina uh, because we've got deplorable roads not just here but all over the state. And we've got to come up with a funding mechanism. We've got the lowest gas tax in the country. And God knows I don't want to pay any more for gas than anybody else does. But what you've got to look at is if I drive 1,000 miles a week, I'm going to burn more gas than the person driving 250 miles a week, so I'm using the roads more. So I'm going to pay my equal percentage. The trucks that will be going through our community will be helping finally pay for the roads uh, that they're utilizing more. And then on the other end, visitors that come to our community and utilize our roads while they're here and buying gas, they'll be helping pay for our roads as well. What I don't want to see happen with the gas tax is the gas tax is we become a contributor to other areas of the state. It's like we do with our tax increment financing district. We've got sort of a rule of thumb. You eat what you kill. In other words, if you generate the tax, you get to use the tax. 
and I don't see us giving to more rural areas to have road improvements in those areas when it's more important that we fix the roads that are being traveled more densely. We do that in economic development. We send funds to Colleton County to help them do economic development. We need to look out for this area on those roads if we're going to generate the tax money. And that's, I know that's not a popular thing to say we need to increase the tax, but on that one, we definitely need to increase it. I guess my fear is that we're going to end up in another legal situation with after the study happens if we keep putting in input as a community and don't like for instance I live near North Red and I don't know if I want an overpass there the sound is already pretty bad so the, the overpass and, and let me tell you because we explained to some of the neighbors uh, yesterday our design of an overpass an overpass would have to be 50 feet in the air it would have to start basically at Camden Camden Street where the church yard ends it would have to go up there it would have to cross over 526 and come down uh, the other side of those townhouses that are on the right so that your entrance and exits to 526 would not be damaged but it would only be a two-lane overpass in other words, you can use it all the time, but when the train is there, it's the only route that you would have, but it would give us the ability to move EMS, fire, and police across those areas. Uh, but it wouldn't stop the entry from any business along that corridor, 526, or any of the residential streets that are, uh, are on the side. Um, the bulk of the noise would be crossing 526 and we've already got that <laughs> noise there anyway um, but again if they can show us something that we as the leadership of the city and the community thinks will work as well then that's fine but um, seeing is believing I don't know that it that, that can happen do you know, um, another lady um, talked about a sound study. Do you know if that is part of the study, the one-year study that they're doing as far as surface traffic? It, it will, uh, not as much on the surface side as the rail side it will. I'm not so sure on the vehicular movement side uh, that it will be. Because yeah. North Red is a four-lane, uh, Rivers is a six-lane. Yeah, until it comes down to the four lane down at the right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. My name is Dale Armstrong, and I just wanted to add an observation. I live on Durant Avenue. I live about um, Caddy Corner, straight behind the apartments to where the rail already comes through. When the trains are coming through, we have a joke in our house. My husband will yell, open the front door, and I say, I'll get the back door because the train's coming through. And what we have found, it's not simply just the noise, in spite of some new windows, in spite of insulation, it's the vibration as well. Especially when the trains are slowing or stopping or speeding up, it's that ramming together of the cars. And things in the house vibrate. Sitting on the sofa watching the TV, I vibrate. The sofa vibrates. The china rattles in the china cabinet. It's amazing. It's simply amazing. We've had, we knew we had an older house, so we were not surprised that we needed to work on the foundation of the house. But that railroad wasn't active when we bought the house. It was about two years later. And we're convinced that the train vibrations have a lot to do with the sandy soil, an old house, and some of the settling of the foundation work we had to have done. So my concern is when we implement this study that you not only be concerned about the sound, but also the vibrations 
and the impact that has. I'm wondering about the rail in the old housing, the Admiral's house, or when you take down those brick buildings and put in new buildings, because if the train goes beside them, it won't be going beside. Right. It won't be, go only be used for the trains that currently go into service the shipyard. Yeah. In that area. Okay. That's not going to be part but of the If line. it comes through McMillan, what about the elementary school and the the newer housing that was built behind the bank there? Will there be? What are we talking about now? The housing behind uh, South McMillan. Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you've got uh, that train line is already there, but it's all the way across Sproul Avenue, which is a five lane. Well, it's not anymore because of one of the things that we're doing, which the no. state wanted us to stop, but we didn't, Spruill Avenue is becoming two-lane traffic with two bike lanes and a center lane. Right. Uh, that's how it's going to be striped when they complete it now. And Ms. Armstrong, the rail by, beside your house, we're going to try to eliminate that rail. I know that, but I'm thinking... Talking about the other areas. But the other areas, no. speaking from my observations and my experience, the impact that's going to have on enhancing other areas if you build sound barriers, you're still going to have those massive vibrations to be concerned about. We're hoping so kind of keep the that line, in mind. The, the main line that it's affecting is the one that will be going through Old East North Charleston, uh, Cameron Terrace, and Charleston Farm. Fine. The we're hoping that what is going to occur with the building of the ships, the, the uh, trains at this other yard that the need to stop and back up and move goes away. Eliminating uh, some of the clanging. Right, and that eliminates the clanging. And the other thing is they said they're going to put better tracks in, better rail, which handles, you've got old rail there, and they've come in and replaced some of the, the wood under it, but they've never really replaced the rail. And so there's better, there's better transportation things that can be done now and they've just never modernized them. So this is going to give an opportunity to modernize those as well so that it's not as much of an impact. But um, I had one of the ladies in Old East North Charleston said in the paper, and she was right, the trains were there when she built her house. And, you know, that's something that we've always lived with. But we think it can be improved. Well, my other concern is one night an engine stopped behind the apartments and it was very late at night and it was there for a long 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 time so finally I went out across the street down there and stood on the other side of the ditch and spoke to the engineer and I of course scared him to death in the dark but once he called his breath and he apologized he had no control over it, but I said, why are you here, and why are you sitting here, and how much longer are you going to be here? And he explained he was waiting for another train to go by or pass or open up. He had no control over it. It was the other train and the dispatch. But the vibrations from his engine idling, or maybe it was two engines for that length of that train, were again simply amazing. I was sitting That's in my living room with my teeth chattering. One of the problems that, that you have, and that is why part of it would be eliminated, you've got a CSX line coming in and you've got a Norfolk Southern line coming in. Uh, this is going to require that they share a line. And uh, that's important uh, because one of the things we discovered uh, is the dispatch for CSX was coming out of Jacksonville, Florida. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times we have threatened engineers. We, uh, they got a little upset with me because we were threatening to write them all tickets. <laughs> but then we discovered that the state only allows, they can block an intersection for six minutes, I think it is, and after that they can be fined. It's five dollars. And the cop's got to walk down the rail line to get to the car to write the guy a ticket. And it's not his fault. He's only doing what the dispatcher's telling him to do. So uh, hopefully out of this dialogue, we could get some better understanding with the state that they need to give us better tools to deal with.
such situations. So just be aware of those situations yes, for the we people appreciate. who, especially new housing and new new facilities, new buildings. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? If not, we do appreciate you you coming out. Rest assured that um, this has been a tough battle on all of us. Uh, I don't think I can credit my five surgeries last year to it, but uh, it still drains you uh, because, believe it or not, we're as concerned as you are about the quality of life of the people within our community. We live here. It's us as well as you. And we're going to continue to fight for that which we think is fair and equitable for our community. But it can't be done unless we have your support. And you have, I, I can't say enough to you. When we called you for public meetings, when we needed to make a stand, you showed up. And that said volumes to Columbia. Uh, when that TV camera came on, and there were 350, 400 people at Park Circle uh, saying that we're, we're, we're going to take you on. Um, it, it helped us in our cause. Part of the settlement we have today is because of you, and we greatly appreciate it. Thank you, and good night.